Welcome, welcome back everyone. This episode, we are going to be continuing our building of our form and we want it so that when we change data and then change it back to what it originally was, the application is smart enough to know that it hasn't changed. So this is what we got right now and if we change one of these values, well first off these buttons look like trash so we're going to give those a little space today. and. If we change this back to what it originally was, well, it's still asking us to save the data, which is just a weird request. It does work, but it's a wasted API call, and it could be confusing to the user because they might think that the data has been changed. I personally would consider this feature not necessary. This is more of like icing on the cake, a little bit improvement on the user experience, and also it allows me to introduce some interesting concepts when it comes to comparing objects. So here's the challenge. What we want to do is we want to keep the original data, which we already have set up, and then compare the new data to what it originally was. If they're the same, well, then we don't need to show these cancel and save buttons. But we have to check that across both of the properties. So that way, both of these are being considered when the data is being compared. So because of that, I don't really think it's smart to keep it inside of the actual inputs. We don't want to have an inline function like we have here. We basically want to have an external function that we can call from both of these inputs to compare all of the data. Because if we just compared the name, for example, in isolation, and it was like, oh, it's the same, we can hide these buttons. But the industry was different than it originally was, we'll likely introduce bugs in our software. So what we want to do is we want to just invoke a function inside of here. Since we already have on change, we can just call it here. Normally you could just pass the name of the function to onChange, but we already have a function defined here. So let's just say compare customers, and we're going to invoke it using parentheses. Same thing down here, compare customers, and now we can define the logic for this function in one location and share it across these two inputs. And the function will be invoked anytime data is changed for either of these. So I'm going to define this up here. We can just define it really anywhere, it doesn't matter. I don't know, here looks great. So we'll say function compare customers. And inside of here, we basically want to decide if these two customers are equal. What two customers am I talking about? Well, specifically the original data customer, which is called customer, and then the temporary data customer. These are objects, but it's not as easy as just comparing them as customer being equal to temp customer. Unfortunately, that's not the case because when you do this, you're checking for equality of identity. Are these the same exact object in memory? And they're not. So this is not going to work. This isn't going to check if their attributes are equal. So there's various ways of doing this and you can research other ones and there's also different packages you can use for simple object comparison. Our object is pretty simple, so we're going to brute force it, just checking the name and the industry. However, if you had a really complex object, or if you ended up adding attributes in here, you would need to remember to update this function. So you kind of have some balance you have to think about here. Do you want to go find a more complex way of comparing object attributes, possibly using external libraries, or do you want to have this function that you now need to maintain, make sure you're comparing all of the different attributes or properties on these objects? If that doesn't really make any sense because you aren't familiar with how this is done, that's fine. Let's just go through the example and see what we can do. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a Boolean flag that assumes they are equal. We will check the properties. If any of them don't match, we will flip that flag. If we manage to get to the end of the function and the flag is still set to equal, that means the data is the same and we can hide the cancel and save buttons. Inside of here, we will start with the flag, which we will just call equal. And we'll start with this being assigned the value true. Now we can just check the different properties. So if customer.name is not equal to temp customer.name, then we will set equal to false. Same thing if customer.industry is not equal to temp customer.industry, then equal is going to be assigned false. Now, after we've gone through each of those properties, we can check if they're equal. And that's Boolean, so you don't need to compare it to anything. Now we can just hide the buttons. And the way we have that figured out is we have this changed state 
which will conditionally show those buttons down here. We did this in an earlier episode. So all we can do is say set changed and pass in false. So that should mean that they are the same and those buttons will go away. So this is pretty close, but it's not perfect. And I'll show you why. If we go to the site, let's do a quick refresh and we change it. Oh no, nothing happens. Those buttons don't show up until the second change, not the first change. And this was bad design on my part, but I decided to go with this because you could run into this. So basically we are executing compare customers right after we set the state. Well, if you remember, I have said that setting state is asynchronous, so we can't be guaranteed that the state is up to date by line 86. Same thing down here for line 99. So what's happening is we initiate that first set state when we change the data and then we immediately compare. And when we compare, that state change hasn't been propagated yet. So we're comparing the initial values of customer and temp customer, which are the same. So we're setting change to false. If you wanted to visualize this, you can just console log customer and temp customer. And on first change here, they are the same. And then on second change, you're seeing the first change data. So what is the solution to this? The way we have it set up is kind of a logical way of setting it up. And that was my first idea. But whenever you have some function that is dependent on state being the most up to date, that is when you want to use use effect. And you can make it depend on just the state that you're interested in watching. So use effect is guaranteed to execute after the state has been updated. So what we'll do is we'll just take this function we've created and move it into a use effect function. We already have this basic one we used earlier just to keep track of all of our state. So what I'll do is I'll just replace all of this. I'll take all of this inside of our function, cut it and take it up and put it inside of our use effect. Now what we can do is we can remove this function and remove the call to that function. And the use effect is going to execute automatically. So we're getting closer. We got one more problem I'll show you. If we do a refresh, uncaught type error cannot read properties of undefined. So the problem is it's not getting the initial values of customer because it's also coming from a use effect. So one simple fix for this is to just say if not customer return. Same thing for the next one, if not customer return. Now, in theory, that initial load is going to be skipped and it won't execute again until we have a state change. So we can say Sony, the buttons pop up, we change it back and the buttons go away. Seems to be working. Perfect. And you can of course get rid of these console logs once you're confident in the functionality. So we will go get rid of those. And you may notice if you're not familiar, we have a single line if here. Whenever you have just one statement in an if, you don't have to put it inside of its own curly braces. So you can just put it on the same line like this here. So this is going to make our function a lot cleaner. There we go. We can just kind of break this up into different sections. All right, cool. Last thing I wanted to do real quick is just make the buttons a little bit more spacious. This is a really easy fix. Inside of our code where we have our two buttons, we're just going to add a real quick class name and I'm going to set this to margin two. Same for this one. So class name is margin two. Now, whenever we get those buttons, they're just a little bit more spaced out and it's a little cleaner. That's all I got in this episode. Hopefully this was fun, just kind of looking at some different options. I think this is one of the episodes where I could have planned it out and just showed you the exact code to use, but I decided let's just build this up from the beginning, what you might run into, and just show you how I thought through that. So hopefully that was helpful and wasn't too confusing kind of jumping around the way we did. Please stay tuned for the next episode. We're going to continue building on this application. Peace out.